My name is Scott Kervan. I'm a visual effects supervisor and virtual production supervisor. Um, on the virtual production side, it's mostly been consulting work. I, I haven't actually worked in any large volumes or anything like that yet. Um, but uh, I'm, I really love virtual production. I love it as a, as a production tool as it relates to storytelling, not just in volumes or with screens and, and things like that, but in terms of how it actually flips the entire production process upside down. And it gets you, like, on set and in camera, you can, using simulcam and techniques like this and, and um, other more traditional just visual effects techniques, you can get, you're, we're, we're getting like 80% of the way towards the final shot on, day, on, on the day you're, on the day, we call it, the day you're filming is on the day. And that's really cool because there are some productions now that are actually turning around nearly complete shots as dailies. And dailies were, used to be when you shot on film, you'd do a, sh a day of shooting, You'd send that stuff out. All the all the the film you shot would go out to a processor. They would process it over the night. Overnight, the next morning, everybody sits down and watches what you you filmed. Make sure you got everything right. Make sure the, the camera didn't mess up or anything like that. Now with digital, we do that all in real time. But virtual production is bringing the entire process so that the so your visual effects are even coming in much sooner and much earlier. And I, I those are, that's why this stuff is like so cool to me. And, and uh, get down to this. And what I'm going to show you is is a way of using. Um, like regular displays. This isn't, so normally when we think of visual effects and, and we think of LED walls and volumes, so you've got a ceiling, wrap around walls, the, uh, the camera's tracked, usually optical tracking. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big production. It's a gigantic investment. It's neat technology, but from an indie filmmaking standpoint, it's not, it's pretty inaccessible. There's people working on making it more accessible, but it's still pretty much way out there. The amount of pre-production working and things like that is, is making it really difficult. Um, if you guys know, do you guys know Ian Hubert, Dyn Dynamo Dream, right? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about indie filmmaking. He does a lot of highly technical stuff, um, but also uses real actors. Uh, everything he's done so far has been pretty traditional pipeline, and I'm lucky enough that he lives just a few blocks from my house. House, so we've been kind of we're we're looking at messing with some of this stuff on on some of the stuff he's doing. Um, types of things you could use this for anything that you would be a normal. Um, if you think of a backdrop on a film set, right? So you've got, it could be uh, rear projection, right? So you've got people sitting in a car and things, things are moving. Well, if all you're looking at is like, those shots are always lock off. So you could still do the same. Lock off means camera doesn't move. You could still set a camera here, look at somebody sitting in a car with a screen behind them and have, have trees and road and cars going by. You can use this for that process. You're limited. That's why the, that lock off matters because you're limited. Now it's not completely locked off. You've got a little bit of freedom, but you kind of can't go off the screen, right? Uh, another thing that you could do is like, this could be a window in a house, right? Say you, you want to, your, your script calls for a shot that's in a small apartment in Chicago, right next to the L, really cheap apartment, dingy place, small window, dark. You're looking down, the, down at, the, at the main characters and through the window, train goes by, right? Trying to set that up and get it timed up and get everything working is nearly impossible, but you could do it with, with this technique. You could buy a big TV, set up uh, in a garage, build that little set, and, and put the TV in the window and pull this off that way. Um, what it does, if you've got something like that, you can actually do, like set up a wide establishing shot. Um, the window's just incidental, it's just creating a setting, right? We aren't telling a story about the window. It's about the characters sitting here, and they're having an argument or whatever. <laughs> And we, so we see the window, and this window might be smaller, much smaller than that, right? Because it's a cheap, dingy little apartment. Set up your wide shot, then you come in, and you go in on, on a tight shot. You can even dolly the camera in and do like, it's called a French over. It's like a dirty over the shoulder shot of, of one of the characters. You've still got the window kind of in the corner. As the camera moves, using this technique, you'll be kind of looking out that window and down at the city because you're maintaining all of that parallax. If you used a backdrop, that was outside that window, it would break. It, it, visually, my mom would pick it up and go, that looks fakey, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as the camera starts to move. This fixes that, it gives us that ability. Um, another fun thing, and kind of what the demo is gonna be, is sort of this, um, I was trying to think, uh, like, what I, one of the things I was coming up with was like, what if we had, and we can do this with multiple monitors, so mm -hmm. I'm doing just one screen, but this could be a whole bunch of little screens like that, right? They could all be just set up in a line on a shelf, with fake boxes behind them, so they look like fish tanks that hold animals or something like that. And that each tank is, has a different alien creature in it. Now again, we aren't telling the story about the alien creatures, but it's what's going on in the room. And the, 
the, the filmmaker, the creatives, the, the DP, the director of photography, he can move that camera anywhere, and these alien creatures are going to look, the parallax is going to be right. It's going to look like they're in cages. You're going to see the back of the cage tilt and move as the camera moves around, and you've got little animated characters in all of it, so you can, you can pull all that stuff off doing this. So those are the types of options and really limitations that we're looking at here. Um, part of what I wanted to do and show here, and this is going to be rough, I'll warn you, because this thing wants to disconnect all the time while we're working with it. It could be just because that's really old. <laughs> and that's, that's what I'm using for my internet. Um, but um, I wanted to do it really with stuff that I have. The only piece of special equipment that I've got that I'm using is really my camera. And my camera is just a regular digital camera. I will turn it on even. Right, it's a, it's a small camera, it's a nice film camera. There we go, so, everybody wave, say hi. <laughs> so this is, the, that's all this is, it's just this is my film camera. The, the components that you need are a film camera, a screen that you want to use, right? We're gonna use this, and that's just gonna be so that you can see what's on the camera. Because what the camera sees is what we're gonna, is what's gonna end up being used. This is just the backdrop in the show, right? For on set, this is on set, that's on uh, what we deliver, right? So. <laughs> Special equipment is a camera uh, to go as cheap as possible. I'm using my phone as the tracker. That's the only tracker I'm going to have. No, I'm not spending even a thousand bucks on a Vive system or anything like that. And I'm going to break all this. Laptop. Right. This is a Nitro 5. I bought it refurb under 2,000 bucks. Put extra memory in it. Put some extra hard drive in it. So it's it's a gaming computer. It's got a 3080 in it. It's a it's a it's a really decent computer, but not crazy. Man. It's not. Not millions of dollars that goes into building the volume or anything like that. So what we're doing here, and it's and this is a cool thing about Unreal and sort of the way everybody works in Unreal. Everybody works in real space. People are five foot eight. Um, a meter is a meter. Things like that. Inside of Unreal, that's that's just sort of the standard. I'm glad everybody does that. That's really important to what we're doing here because we're actually going to have to match this screen in real life to this camera in real life to a version of this stuff in Unreal. And so that's the pieces we have to go through real quick. I'm going to go through this in a way that's going to feel like it's got probably some flow. It is not the natural way to approach this. The way I did this the first time, it took me, probably took me five days to get it all together and working. Um, I'm going to do it in about 20 minutes here. <laughs> um, and it's going to look like, I'm, like it makes sense and that's how you think about it. This is not how you think about it. Um, we're using something called end display here. End display is, is this plug-in system inside of Unreal that lets you take what you've built in the game engine and project it onto multiple screens in space, in real space, right? So if I, I could use both of these screens, and I could put that screen over there, as long as I tell Unreal that one screen is here and one screen's over there, it'll all work, right? Is that something that you have to have that plugin for, or can Unreal do that natively? It's native. Yeah. It's all, this is all built into Unreal. Yeah, 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 and the coolest thing is like, so um, I said, you know, how much everything costs? Unreal's free, um, and the source okay. code's all there, so that was really important to me as a, as a technical supervisor that we have access to code, so if things break, we can get in there and fix it. But yeah, the, the free stuff, like this stuff, people are, people are training. It's, it's $10,000, $5,000, $20,000 for a course now to learn this crap. Yeah. This, <laughs> and I almost swore, this, this stuff, <laughs> this stuff was, was, was built uh, in the community. It was all put out there for free. All the initial training was all free, and now that stuff is all getting siloed and, and put into wall gardens. I don't like that. That's one of the main reasons I'm doing this, because I want, I want people to know that this stuff is actually accessible. You don't, you can figure it out on your own. You can, you can just go to something like this, see what I do, then you got me as a contact, you can ask me questions. So, I think I'm going to get going. So like I said, I got, I got to know where everything is in the real world. Can I have somebody get at the, the whiteboard, and I need you to take some notes for me, because we need to measure things. So, write the word display, and I'm doing this absolutely from scratch. Right? So I'm not, none of this is planned, none of this is prefab. I am going to crash and burn, and you're all going to get to enjoy it. Right? <laughs> so uh, write down X, and write down Y, and write down height, or HD, right? X, we are, and I'm going to give it to you, man. You want to get how exact you want to get. There we go. Uh, is, that, is, that, right. is that full screen on there, or is there some black border on um, Oh, yeah, go all the way to the edge of the white. <coughs> so oh, here we go. I yep. See. yep, got it, yep. got it. Okay. All right, uh, 2.30. And you're using metric, right? Yep, this yeah. is centimeters, is what I'm, yeah, what I'm saying. Kind of important for the setup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 1.30 is the height. <laughs> that should be roughly 16 by 9. <laughs> uh, the height. Now, um, one of the things that you end up having to do is when you, you build all this stuff to real scale inside of Unreal, 
scale is important and, or, and where things are relative to each other, but also where they are in the world. When I turn my camera on as a, a tracker, it will boot itself up at the world origin. So everything has to be relative to that. And so what I'm doing here is I'm, I've got my camera kind of roughly here already. And I think that's about a meter back. Uh, 40. Uh, five. One. One seventeen, please. Four. And this is right down camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the height, the height on the square. Sorry, I got distracted. Uh, let's call that 84. So I'm going to make sure my camera <clears throat> to the center of the lens is the same height. Let's see if I can do that with holding this to fall in place. Oh, I'm going to have to change that. It's that distance to the camera, I think. So basically, I've got the center of the lens at the exact same height as the bottom edge of this, right? Because I'm making this my world origin. I'm going to build everything off of that. So this is going to kind of come from the world origin out. Ah. My display is going to go up from there. <clears throat> uh, all right. Change, please change my camera distance to. And as a visual effects supervisor, all I do is measure shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 108, please, is the camera distance. Um, this is a 45 millimeter lens, so write down 45 millimeter, please. Yeah. Does the sensor size matter? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Unreal. Because that gives that gives you the, the the sensor size and the length of your lens. Yeah. That gives you your FOV, right. mm -hmm. which is so if you have we call them a short lens. Like this is a, I said this is 45. So if that was half of that, if that's only a 22 millimeter lens, um, that's going to pull that sort of that sensor size closer, and that little triangle that that makes gets wider. So a shorter lens makes for a wider field of view. Um, just some basic camera stuff there. I don't, if you guys want more info on that, uh, let me know about it and I'll put it up on the website. Because it's all, it's all cool stuff, it's, it's, it's fun. This is a full, um, full sensor, 35 millimeter camera. So this, the, the lens on this, I, or the, I know that the sensor is 36 by 24, 25. Um, there's a preset in Unreal, so I just, yep. I just grabbed that. Um, so that gives me that and that, and that is all I have to worry about. I'm also going to go through this, and I'm not even going to enable plugins as I uh, until I need them, so that you can kind of see logically what's happening. <clears throat> I do have two. I'm eating up all my time just talking. <laughs> uh, I have two things to be aware of with which is just how I work in Unreal. Um, five two. Sorry. What am I going to call this new folder? Let's call it. Uh, live demo, right? Uh, normally, you have to go into Unreal Launcher and like start up Unreal. There's you end up basically going to the game store, it logs into the internet. It takes forever. Uh, so as an engineer, I'm like, yep, that, and uh, <laughs> just wrote some code so I can just like one click get Unreal up and running. That's useful. Uh, it's quick, called Quick Launch. It's up on my GitHub. I'm gonna have to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it gets Unreal like running like super. It's just, it's just, all it does, it's just a, a, a shortcut. It's the same thing, like if you double click a file, uh, Unreal starts up, so. It starts it up in a, in a really uh, minimal mode, so whereas normally in Unreal 5 and forward, there is a set of mesh modeling tools or static mesh modeling tools that are available for you. Uh, they're just not enabled yet. Oh, dismiss that, update that. Um, so that's something that I'm gonna have to enable that you won't have to do if you're using Unreal 5 or better. If you're using an earlier version of Unreal, you'll have to turn this on. This works, the same method that I'm doing here works from like Unreal uh, 4, 426, 427 is when they introduce these tools. Um, you, there's a, there's a text-based version of it, the same things apply in 425, but there's not the nice interface for it. Um, so here we go, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create myself a level because uh, the second tool I use all the time under my file menu actually, <laughs> Here's another cool thing about this. So I wrote another plugin because I don't like the scale of the 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 interface. So I have oh that's plugins. I don't want plugins. I wrote a plugin that I always have enabled by default. It's called Scooter Utils. Uh, it's also up on my GitHub. I've got my screen shrunk down by eight, to eighty percent of normal size because I, I like I like screen real estate and I don't like big fonts. Uh, but for your sake, I'm going to change that. Uh, there we go. Now we got bigger fonts, so it should be a little bit easier to read what I'm doing. 
grid level. Nope, I'm already going the wrong direction here. So I'm just creating a basic blank world uh, rather than it starts out with uh, this gigantic world space and we don't need it. So I just I just want to keep it simple. Uh, and I'm going to add something to it because Unreal won't let you save that level until there's something in it. Call it main. Um, I was go to my project settings first, and I set that as my default map and mode, so that if I have to reboot, it will always bring me back to the same level. Otherwise, it, it brings you back to that default beginning level, even if you've already got stuff built. It's an extra step to get into it. I hate extra steps. Um, the plugin I showed you that I just used to, to scale the font with, it drops a couple things in here for me. Uh, restart editor is one of them. So just to make sure I've done that properly, I can just hit restart editor, just shuts everything down and brings it back up. <clears throat> Which is a nice thing to have when you're dealing, dealing with stuff like <clears throat> end display because Unreal will get wacky and it's nice to just shut it all down and start it back up. It's nice if you have a fast way to do it. Um, so anyway, here we go, let's get this out of here for now. I'm gonna build that screen. Um, I don't have an asset pre-built, so we're just gonna grab a plane and make it out of a plane. <clears throat> This is the plane that's part of the engine. <clears throat> if I try to modify this plane and try to resave it, Unreal won't let me do that. So I have to create my own copy of that plane, which I will try to do. Uh, finding it in the browser, it's right here. I'm gonna drag that back in from the engine. It's, it's in the engine content, sticking it back into my content, make a copy uh, in there. Good habit just to rename it. Uh, SM for static mesh, underscore OG for original, uh, plane. I always make one backup copy before I make a copy I start messing with because if I mess it up, I want something I can go back to. So I'll just duplicate this, rename that one, SM underscore uh, projector screen. Um, default plane comes into Unreal, it's <clears throat> one meter by one meter. <clears throat> so I'm gonna make it face towards us. And um, before I scale it, <clears throat> a little bit of old-timey uh, television theory. Uh, if you go to like a low level on a display and you want to plot a pixel, zero, zero is up here, mm -hmm. right? X goes like this, and Y, and y could, so the scan line used to go like this on TVs. That's why that's X, and this is Y. Then we get into computer graphics. Mathematicians get hold of the same information. They're using graph paper, and they put zero, zero down here. So if we look at the plane I'm messing with, and I will create a material to demo this. This is like the simplest material. Again, just gonna make this from scratch. I'll call it MUVs. And create a couple of constants and a uh, texture coordinate. Go. <clears throat> I'm going to use the constant of zero into my base color and my specular to make sure I've got a, a black object. Um, it's overkill, but I make a constant of one and stick it into my roughness so I know that that object is completely, perfectly flat black. Then I take the texture cord, I wire that into my emissive color, so now that's a fully bright object that maps the UVs into uh, directly onto the object so we can see the, the UVs. That's my plane. And what we're looking at here is that the way we have this oriented, um, red is X and green is Y in Unreal World. That's uh, X, Y, Z, R, G, B. So red goes like this. That zero, zero is right there. So our X is up. Our Y is that way. If I go to local coordinates and like that, um, red is X, green is Y. Our zero, zero is down there, which is which is exactly not what we want because we need a physical real world representation of our screen. If we have our UVs upside down, our screen is gonna show up upside down when we try to project to it. Um, that's a mis Again, like I said, th this is gonna seem like, I, like this is making sense, but usually you start at the other end of this and make all the mistakes mm -hmm. as you move forward until you learn all these things. So easy to fix, rotate this thing 90 degrees, ta-da, there we go. I'm um, gonna look at do that and I like to stay in space. Uh, 
Now I'm going to scale this thing. And we said we were 230 centimeters by 130 centimeters. Um, this is this is the scale of the object, one by one by one. That's a meter. This is a one meter square. So to get from one one meter to 230 centimeters, we multiply it by 2.3, or I just stick in stick in 2.3. It does it. So in x we go 2.3. And in Y, we go 1.3. That's our screen. Um, it's the same size now. It's the same, ori same orientation as that. Now I have to get everything lined up. And I could leave this where it is, and I just move it around real carefully. I like to move pin pivot points around. So again, I've got like a one-click reset to move things around if I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the pivot point off of this, which is the center of this screen right here, and I'm going to move it right here. So that's what these next steps are, is to, is to get this screen in the right spot and move the pivot point out in front of it. So that is when I need to enable that modeling plugin because it's not on by default. Static mesh editor modeling mode. Uh, up on the website that the URL is for, uh, or was up there for, I've, got, I've already got listed these plugins that you need to enable to do this stuff. I'll, I'll flush that out with an actual tutorial um, soon. Uh, now I've got a modeling mode here, so I can switch into that in Unreal. And I'm going to work on this guy. And there is some pivot controls here, which are really awesome. I love that they added this stuff. It saved me so much time. I don't have to go out to Blender or to 3D Studio Max or to Maya to modify an object anymore. I can do almost all that work right inside Unreal now. So uh, first thing, bake RS, bake rotation and scale. That's going to realign that axis. Oh no, you know what I did? I am working on my original plane. <laughs> and not, so Unreal won't let me save it because I was going to do that. So I am going to, as fast as I can, pop back through that whole process again. This time with the plane that I made but didn't drag into the, into the, into the scene. But should go relatively quick. Uh, rotate it so it faces that way, rotate it so it faces this way. Um, double check it by throwing the material on there. That looks good. Uh, the scale was 2.3 by 1.3. Easy peasy, right? Cool. Uh, now, I've rotated that and I've scaled it. I want to bake that. So, like, since I was using the wrong object, when I tried to force Unreal to do something, it reset everything and put that plane back. I want this thing, if, if anything resets that plane, I want it to be my plane and not Unreal's plane. So that's exactly what this step does. Um, bake rotation scale. There we go. That was realigns. That just, sorry, so for the, the bake, was it like you were trying to bake a primitive? Like the, the plane that. It's like I've real. taken the static mesh plane. Yeah. And I've taken all the all the verts and I've moved them, but the, the transform stays the same. So what I've done is I've, I've used the transform to manipulate the object, and then I've reset the transform back to world, um, like Z up, mm -hmm. um, that sort of stuff. So that's a really I mean, different. The one that you did where it went long, and was that because it was like the. That's because that was the plane I grabbed from the engine. Yeah. Okay. And Unreal, like, like so there's, uh, if I, and I'll go there real quick. Yeah, so this is the content. You've got content and engine. Content is your stuff that you're messing with and you're adding. Engine is all the stuff that comes by default that you're pulling. So it's, there's a lot of default materials and objects and other scripts. Um, all this, all this um, end display stuff is actually in the engine. We could dig, dig down into it. Um, but Unreal won't let you actually write to any of that stuff. So that's that's what happened is I tried to write to it and it said, it said oh no, I'm not going to let you do that. Thanks. Yeah. So that was, I baked the rotation of the scale. Now what I want to do is I move that pivot down to the bottom of that object. Um, there's another button that says pivot that lets you actually do more modifications. I'm going to just click bottom. It's going to move it down there. Hit accept. Now if I, uh, um, down here, this is my transform. This is the position of that, that object in space. So it's currently at 2.9 meters out in X. Uh, it's 100. It's 1.1 meters off to one side, and it's five centimeters up off the ground or something like that, or wait, I don't know, whatever. There we go. Anyway, I reset that all to zeros. This is actually where my world origin is now. That's kind of what I wanted to know. So I, I set that up. I've got to move this back now to my camera position, which we said was 108, right? <clears throat> uh, so that moves that back, and now I'm going to go back to that pivot stuff. And I went right past it. There we go. One of the buttons here is world origin, which no matter where the object is in space, it'll move that pivot to the world origin. So 
I say world origin, hit accept. Now that is actually, um, like if I rotated it based on the camera position, that's what I'd expect. So that gives us that plane. <clears throat> Save all that out. That's like, that's like the biggest pain in the ass right there is, is building this stuff, right? Um, add a cine camera. Because this is going to represent our camera. This camera gives us the ability to, to modify like the f-stops and the lenses and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm going to hit uh, the reset on the transform here, which is going to put that camera at the world origin, which is where we've already got it. Uh, I'm going to go into the camera. I'm going to set my film back to a full frame DSLR. And we look in there, that's the 36 by 24 millimeter film back on the camera. Uh, my lens is a, uh, I'll go, 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 that's my stops, focus. Nope, lens. Uh, is it for, anybody see my focal length? Why am I not seeing it? There it is. All right, current focal length 45. And for the sake of this, I'm going to turn off focusing because the Unreal camera, you see how it's out of focus? Uh, I'm going to disable that. It's usually easier to work if you disable that and then put, turn it back on when you know what you're, what you're getting what you want. So that gives us our camera position where we want it. That gives us our um, our screen where we want it. Want to get the camera to move? I burned a day on this, and it's the easiest damn thing to do. <laughs> um, but I need to enable live link. There we go. And again, you notice how I'm restarting, restarting as I enable this stuff. That's why I want everything kind of centered and, and stuck where it belongs in the world, because I don't want, for some reason, one of these things to move when it loads back in. So here we go. Um, this is the live link window. Oops. Hello. There we go. And what it wants is a live link source. And so you go to mes message bus source, and there's nothing showing up in this little list over here. This is what you live link to. And in Unreal, there is everybody knows about live link face, and there's VCAM. Unreal Remote 2 is what you want to use for this. It's like, it's simple. It's just a tracker. That's all it is. Um, I've got. I need to know my IP address for my machine here. So I'm going to grab that real quick. Uh, command prompt, uh, look for IP config. My IP address is 192.168.0.100. That's what that thing's feeding me. So I have to type that into here. 100, I hit connect. As soon as I do that, if I load that source, you can now see Scott VFX iPhone active. So that's, I'm already connected um, live. Um, I was holding my phone like this when I turned on, so my phone thinks the world origin is here. Um, that's fine. <laughs> uh, that's, that's perfectly fine for what we're doing right now. Get this out of my way. There you go. Grab your camera. You add a live link component to it. Live link controller is what you add. And then right at the top, subject, subject representation, when you select that, camera transform shows up. Um, so you just select that, look at that, man. Yeah. Camera's wow. tracking, right? So that's how easy that is. This thing I chased and chased and chased for a good solution. It also breaks a lot. So um, it just currently stops. But that's, I just wanted to show you that that's, that's all it takes to set up live one, right? But now we've got to get this thing projecting. That's where you got to use end display. And I have to turn on end display to get that working. This is going to take a couple minutes um, because it is a plugin. And it recompiles all of your shaders when it does, when it comes on. I don't know why it doesn't need to, but it does. So here we go. 39, 45, 75. Oh, that's not going to be too bad. Yeah. Also, probably we don't want to have a lot of assets in there yet because it'll have to redo them all. So one thing uh, you want with your, if you're going to use a phone, uh, it broke. It probably broke because I turned my phone because this thing realigns. And every time you do that, it kind of sends a shock through the system. So you don't want to be banging your, your, your tracker around, don't want to be rotating around. Any pop-ups will break the connection. If, uh, if you switch screens to go turn something on or off, it'll break the connection. You end up having to go back in and restart. There's probably a good way to like, go in and restart this stuff, but I don't know how to do it um, yet. Um, so I'm just going to go uh, under, uh, back to our content browser. I'm going to, if you go, there's an end display right here. You had an end display config. We're going to start with a new config. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to let it make any assumptions for me. We're going to set this thing up from scratch. And I'm going to call it 
NDC for uh, N Display Config underscore um, Laptop Studio. And we will open that. And this is like a normal blueprint where this is all the components in the blueprint. And you can see in here, we've got some components added. This cluster here represents our network. So basically this thing. I could have multiple computers connected to that and we could add them all. Each computer can have multiple displays. You can run multiple screens off of a computer. We add those here. This thing pops up like a tree. I'm just gonna add one, you'll see that. And then as we have to set settings in here, this is just a normal details panel. So this is end display. This is end display config. Now it's actually really nice, pretty easy to use. Right click on cluster, add new cluster node. Uh, you've got your preset for the size. That's the size I'm using. Um, you, can, you can pick anything you need there. Uh, you do want to change the IP address. Uh, you can stick with localhost, which is 127001. It's kind of a universal localhost. But uh, if you ever start using multiple machines, it's going to be a disaster. So don't do that. Just, just change it. 192.168.0.100. I'm going to add that. And it, now you can see it's got this tree of stuff. And it's got our, another representation of our screen here. Um, the, this is our hierarchy of components that are added by default. We don't need this display because we just create, we created a screen that we're going to add ourselves. So I'll delete that. I'm going to add a static mesh. Right. I'm going to name it my screen. Right. Um, and with that selected in the details panel, uh, I want to select the, the, the asset that we created. Um, assets and actors, I don't want to get into the time of explaining the difference there. Um, assets are what are on disk. Actors are what you drag into your scene. This one's assets. So the actor, that, the screen that I have here already, I'm going to have to delete that. It's just going to be an extra one. So let me quick do that. And I called it SM underscore, what did I call it? Projector? Projector screen. So there's the screen. It pops in. Um, we are going, then you have to go to your, is it the viewport? Uh, yeah, the viewport, which is which is the basically the uh, cluster is the network, host is the computer, node is the graphics card, I believe, and the viewport is the monitor or the display connected to each graphics card. So you can have multiple displays on, on your graphics card. You go to that, and under here you have a projection policy. We need to set that to mesh now because we did change that to a mesh, and we have to tell which mesh. I called it my screen, so we'll set it to my screen. And good thing, it shows up and it's right side up. That means our UVs are correct on our screen. Mm -hmm. So we're doing, we're doing great there. The next thing we add is we add a ICVFX camera. That adds a, a camera to our, um, dis our, our end display config. And that allows us to associate the camera that we've already got the live link connected to with this display. This stuff gets, it gets a little weird. <laughs> And a lot, a lot sort of followed. Like I said, there was a lot of things that I, I broke trying to figure this out. So this is the this is the, the Cine camera actor that is already in our scene. I select that, and that I believe is everything I need in end display to get this to work at this point. Um, quick note: uh, I'll put this in their VP roles. Uh, I always add something here because it just it avoids an error that pops up later on. We don't need it; it doesn't do anything. So I'll add a role called poop. Um, the back to live link real quick. One thing I forgot is I do need to add that source back in here. I need a preset because what we're going to do is we're going to basically shut out of Unreal and start Unreal back up in game mode, and the game is what we're going to see on the screen. Uh, we need to tell the game which live link controller to use, and that's what this bit is here. So I've got to set a preset for it. So um, live link. Preset underscore um, Scott's iPhone. Right. Okay. Then go to project settings. And if we look for live link again in settings, there is a spot for us to put that preset. So we'll do that. I am just searching my brain, going, okay, what are you forgetting? What are you forgetting? Uh, I think that's it. Um, I need, there's another plugin I need to add, which is Switchboard. And the Switchboard plugin allows you to, to run Unreal from outside of Unreal. It, it just, it fires up sort of zombie versions of Unreal. You can, you can, you can run it in different configurations, but it's set up um, 
to, to run like these and display um, displays. So uh, switch board. This one should be real quick. While we're doing this, I said, um, so I mentioned that when this comes to life, it decides where the world origin is. So I just I, I killed the app and restarted it. That should set this as my world origin for the camera. Do you have to do it that way, or is there a way you can reset that in the app? There's probably a way to reset it, yeah. yeah. Um, I just have it. Uh, I think what you want to do is probably set some, some blueprints up and some triggers so you can actually, from outside, get at it. He knows. <laughs> Maybe one thing, uh, when you install the engine for the first time, uh, in the editor preferences, there's actually an install option for switchboard that installs all the dependencies and yeah. stuff and whatever goes on in the background. That's only when you install for the first time the engine version? Yeah. If you don't do that, when you <coughs> enable this plugin, the first time you try to run switchboard, it'll, it will it'll install it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but luckily I've done that, so we don't have to wait for that. Um, there's two parts to switchboard. One's a listener, and the other one is, is the switchboard itself. Um, listener sits on all of your computers that are out on your network that you're going to be using with this system, and it just waits for commands from a switchboard that's somewhere else centrally located. Uh, and the listener is what actually fires off basically command lines to run Unreal and make it do things for you. So um, I took a quick look down here, make sure that ball's still green. <laughs> I'm going to launch the listener if I haven't already. I don't think I had. Yeah. So the li listener comes up. It minimizes right away so that it gets out of your way. Um, really not much there to see anyway. Uh, if I click this icon, this is the switchboard plugin I just added. Um, as mentioned, if, if, it, if this is the first time you run it, it installs Python and some libraries and other things for you. But so. I've already been using this, and you'll see it says switchboard slash C. C was another project I was playing with. So I'm going to create a new config. Since I launched it from inside of Unreal, it already knows what my project name is, live demo. And it's, it's already said, OK, the, the U project file is called that, and the engine directory is there. Double check it, make sure it looks good. If you're running this on multiple machines that, ha that things are installed on different drives, you're going to have to dig into config files and get them all perfectly set. Otherwise, nothing's going to work properly. But this is all good for us. Um, I said you can use Switchboard to do different things. Uh, so Switchboard is kind of about, it's also about multi-users. So if we were a team of artists, but we all wanted to work on the same scene, you could use Switchboard to launch all of those instances of Unreal so we could work on it in a shared space. Switchboard will do that. Switchboard also does uh, and display. And if uh, that, this is what, how you select what it's doing. So uh, Unreal is the, is the shared version and displays what we're working with. Um, pops up this add end display device, just hit populate. It's smart enough to know that I've already got an end display asset. It picked my NDC, NDC underscore laptop studio asset. Say OK. And this is our node. There's a little, uh, little plug in here. The node represents this computer, so each computer would have its own node. I just click the little plug in thing, it connects, everything lights up. I have a, a connected yes here, and I have the ability, this, this up arrow button, it's how I launch Unreal. So, all right, cross our fingers, see what happens. <clears throat> Everything minimizes, and it basically does like a mini compilation of the game, so it's going to rebuild the shaders. It takes just a couple minutes to do this. Um, so and it should come up. But it looks like it's working. It is, but we've got, I basically have that, I left that big stage piece in there. Right. Yeah, yeah, the, the, map. <laughs> the extra one. Right, I forgot about that. So cancel out of that. There we go. Oh, I can even add my end display to my scene. So, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, uh, I actually have like a little scene. It's not much to see, but we'll get an idea of what's going on here anyhow. Uh, NDC dragging my laptop studio. Again, I'm going to reset its position. You can see already that it knows what it's doing. Um, this is what they call the inner frustum, which is what the camera is seeing. And it, it puts in the end display itself, sort of fills in the background with a static image that at least gives you some lighting, things like that. We're not worried about that right now. And I will just save. How much time do I got? Uh, we got nine minutes left. Nine minutes. Right? Everybody, I'm cutting into your Q&A time. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to, I want to put something in here. So hopefully in the future we'll be able to have longer sessions because for something like this, it's definitely more technical. But. This is, there's so many pieces to this. Yeah. That, yeah, it's just tough. Um, yeah, why don't I bring in Dennis? So we've got somebody sitting here. So Dennis is a full-size human being. 
And so if you look at where he is relative to the screen, he's about the right size. That's uh, just kind of a good sanity check there. Save it, and we'll go back to switchboard. And we'll relaunch. <clears throat> Green ball, that's good. Okay. So Dennis is off to the edge. The camera is looking directly to the bottom of the screen, and we're seeing the back of Dennis's foot. So that's all good so far. And, and what you're doing here, and why am I not? Oh, I need to get my screen on. Camera. And it's bumped this, so that's <laughs> failed again. Like I said, this thing's flaky. So yellow ball, come on, give me that back. Do you think the flakiness is from the Wi-Fi connection, or do you think it's the actual it's, app? It, it could be the Wi-Fi or anything. Are there any um, compensations, like delay compensations, so that you have less lag? Well, so, yeah, typically you'll, you'll put, you'll gen lock, um, there's, you, there's like a time code on stage, and you'll get all the displays and your camera and everything gen locked, and if things are a little bit out of sync, you can resync them in post, mm -hmm. correct, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's some reason. <laughs> yeah. But even, even a high-end tracking system has somewhere between yeah. two to five frames delay. That's Interesting. Possible. Even yeah. the high-end systems. Yeah. Wow. Uh, mostly it's not the tracking system itself. It's the video processing pipeline. Under the frame, pushes yeah. it out. It needs to go to the monitor. The other right. So. Yeah. I always wondered what the delay would be. How well known is this in the industry? Hello. Hey, here we go. We're live. Yeah. Not live, but I. No, I put the computer again. Lost the connection. So. Mm. Making progress though. Really, so close. Yeah. So if you were trying to use multiple cameras, is that something where you, you could use one computer to run that with like multiple inputs, or is that something where you need to run multiple instances on different machines? Yeah, you typically have like one machine, I believe, mm -hmm. that, that sort of is in charge of managing where the cameras are. Uh, yeah. All right. And you know, there we go. So this is not lining up. Uh, so something's out of out of adjustment. It doesn't even look close. Yeah, that's not right. So, but anyway, at this point, it's a lot of fiddling and tweaking. Um, you saw that I've got a camera in my end display now. Usually, if I've got a little bit more time, I'll actually go through um, how to um, calibrate it. So you take the the end display node and you attach just an empty actor to it as a child, and then you attach the camera to that empty actor. Um, the camera will then track around, but you can kind of move your origin by moving that actor around, that, that middle node. So I could just like grab that actor and, and move this frustum up to exactly where I wanted to see it and things like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's, it's just the last bit, so. It's just, yeah, wow, well, it's just, it's time, you know. Now, Scott, did you already post some of those sample videos you showed me way back when where you're moving the camera? And you have this great sense of parallax and depth on your screen. Yeah, that's pro I should probably just show that because that's yeah, because it, it's a really cool effect. A yeah, that guy blew me away. I'm just yeah. like, wow. I just wanted to say thank you I'll to Scott. Good. Thank you yeah, so much yeah, for yeah. presenting. I hope you guys learned something. And if you join our Discord, hopefully we'll have a more in-depth tutorial so you can get all those settings. No, so that's the that's the guy in the box sort of thing. And this was like a, a completely uncalibrated test. I was mainly looking at it, and I get the corners of the box pinned. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 3D model. Well, in the computer. But I mean, that tracking is pretty good for real time. Sure. Yeah. So you can see behind it, there's no. Yeah. Yeah, that was. So to do that on set, we build a little. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have to Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, like, all the way up. Right, right. Uh, so there's like a uh, flexibility from the computer. It's with <laughs> their in-game players. Yeah. Unless, uh, you know, there's just a client or everything has sign off all the way up to the right. working. 